um, have kind of a lengthy praise and worship, and I'll try to be as brief without cutting God short as I can, if that's possible. Um, I, I'm still on my Babylonian kick. Um, it's something that, you know, I noticed that, you know, Brenda brought forth a song, uh, she was talking about, so I think it was songs two weeks ago, weren't you, some of the things that we're singing are, aren't scriptural, and of course, the, as soon as she said that, the first song that popped into my mind was the one where it says, he, he tells every lightning bolt where to go, and I'm thinking, you realize there's over 200 people killed by lightning every year, so really, what are you singing? So yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, the first time we had that song, but then you can always t- look at it this way. People are just getting in the way of where he's telling it to go. And if they could really hear God, they'd stay away from that spot. Yeah, so it just depends on how you look at it. <clears throat> but when the, that first verse came, when we first sang that song, I saw, and that's the first thing that popped into my head. And, it, you know, that's... And what? What? Oh, okay. Oh, you were thinking of it, the lightning, the spiritual lightning, yeah. But yeah, but when most people sing it, they're thinking natural, you know. <laughs> oh, it could be. I don't know. It could be. Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with Job. I've read it several times, but I, I guess I need. I'll go look that up when I get home. Anyway, just certain things that uh, as God hones in your giftings and everything, you just begin to recognize when people are saying things and, you know, when we're doing things in the church that are going to actually hinder what God wants to do. So I want you to turn with me to Daniel. I want to read uh, Nebuchadnezzar's first dream in the book of Daniel. Uh, I, I realize, I think, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, king Nebuchadnezzar, is uh, actually, in a sense, represents, you know, the devil. <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, there's some kind of cool stuff that happens to him. And I like the fact, and I don't want to read all of it because it's so lengthy, but when he had the dream, what he asked his soothsayers and his astrologers and everybody, he said, I want you to tell me the dream that I had. And see, I like that. No, I like that because, you see, that weeds out all the fakes. Yeah, that's so good. That's very true. You know, I mean, I, would, I know this is going to sound terrible, but it's almost like I sometimes wish Nebuchadnezzar was in the church. You know, and he'd go up to some of these people, you know, that are given these, all of this stuff and say, all right, it's easy to interpret dreams. It's easy to give somebody a word, sing to me, sing to me, I love you, my child, da, da, da. I, I, but to do something like that where it's going to separate, it's either, God or it it's either God or it's not. And, and I don't like the fact, look, I don't like the fact that he said, I'm going to hack you in pieces and make your houses rubble, but you better be hearing God if that's going to be the outcome of you not hearing him. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's, they wouldn't have, yeah, if we actually had to do that, I wonder how much prophesying would go on. And laying on of hands and supposing miracles, if, if that was actually the case. And so whenever I read that story, to me, you know, because of the way I am, I always find that very refreshing. <laughs> because he, he said, look, I want you to tell me, my, you guys have all claimed to be these, these ministries. And he says, now you're going to have to prove that you're these ministries. So you tell me my dream. You know, and of course, none of they all come up with excuses. Well, nobody's ever been able to do that. Nobody can do that. Nobody can tell the king his dream. Well, then how can you tell an interpretation of it? So what it was showing was that there's a God who can show the dream and the interpretation. And that's what, that's what Daniel did. So I always like that part of the story whenever I read it. I think, oh, man. <laughs> At least right in that instance, Nebuchadnezzar, you're my kind of guy. <laughs> I know it's terrible because he, he actually represents the devil in here. But it's also interesting, too, because you'll find in King Nebuchadnezzar that there's several times in his life that he bows the knee and confesses that Jesus, in a sense, that Jesus is Lord, that God is the king. 
And that references the Scripture that says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So it shows us that the devil is going to confess that, he, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But notice it was, it, was tremendous, it was a tremendous God event every time that happened. And whenever a real God event happens, every knee bows. That's the way it's supposed to be. And see, that's what the church is supposed to become. In other words, when people, we look at events, and I've shared this several in the last several weeks, we look at events and we say, Jesus Christ is Lord. But what, what if people could look at a group of people and it was so eventful, they would bow the knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what's supposed to happen. That's where we're going. And, and, so it, and sometimes it can be kind of discouraging for, for Kathy and I or even other ministers when we see how the level of minuscule stuff that bothers us or that throws us for a loop, it's almost like, I mean, if it wasn't for the Word telling us, you'd lose heart. You know what I mean? Because people get so whacked out at stuff that is so nothing. You know, imagine if you were in, in King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and he threw this at you. You know, we're worried about tinker toy stuff that throws us for a loop. What if you were Daniel? I mean, Daniel was one of those guys. He, you know, he had been placed in a position of knowledge and everything. It wasn't that Daniel... Daniel was going to get killed with all the rest of them. Now imagine if you were put into those kinds of positions. And it wasn't this, it wasn't the only time either. We have the lion's den situation. We have uh, the furnace situation. So it was several times they were put in different dire straits. And we get thrown from, from, you know, I don't know, just, huh? Yeah, uh, well, a bell or what, you know, just tinker toy stuff. <clears throat> well, I'm just saying that it, it you know, you. When, I read, when I'm going to read this, we're supposed to be the ones that when people look at the church, when it finally matures, and I understand we're growing there, when it finally matures, people will bow the knee and say, Jesus Christ is really Lord. Because you've got a lot of different uh, information out there of people trying to find salvation in many different ways. You know, mankind is trying to end hunger. He's trying to end, you know, murder. All the bad stuff that's happening, he's trying to end on it in his own power. Well, when the church actually becomes what it's supposed to be, they'll look and they'll say, Jesus Christ really was Lord. They've been, you know, the people have been saying that for centuries. But we finally see something now that shows that He is Lord. doesn't mean that they'll accept it, but they'll have to bow the knee and say He is Lord. Because if you look at Nebuchadnezzar, you'd think every time he, he, he wrote one of these things and said, you know, the God of Daniel is the God of all gods and He can do anything, and then he turns right around and he goes out and sets up an image of himself and wants everybody to bow down and worship it. And you're thinking, I don't get this. You'd think once he found out who God was, he'd, but see, that's not the way it is. Just because you bow down and say Jesus Christ is Lord doesn't mean necessarily that you'll give in to Him. You're just recognizing how big and powerful He is. And you're bowing the knee and saying that, okay? So all I want to do is read Daniel's interpretation of the dream. I've got to find it here. <clears throat> um, where is it, Frank? 224. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Let's see. I'm, I'm looking at 224. Yeah, I'm in Daniel. I know it's Daniel chapter 2 somewhere. <clears throat> no, no, that's not wrong. I just want to give the interpretation where Daniel gives the interpretation of the dream. Yeah, it's got to be later, yeah. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. So that was close, okay. Which part? Start at 29. 29. <clears throat> Yeah, 27, that's where I wanted to start, yeah. Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and I'm going to try to stay in the New King James. I may end up in the NIV, you know how I do. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, 
The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. Now, as I read this, Think about what I've ministered the last couple of times I've been up here, okay? I was watching, and behold, there was a great image. This image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet of partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Now, I don't know what I've taught, because it's been a while since I've been in Daniel. I know what other people teach, and they teach that that stone is Jesus. And I don't think that. I think this stone is the church. because we're his body. I mean, ultimately it is because he gave us this power. But I want you to notice, Jesus lived on the earth. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father, and Babylon is still alive and well. It hasn't been broken into pieces yet. So that's what we get to do. This is a stone. Now notice it says it's cut out without hands. So that means there's going to be no human part, no fleshly part. If there's any human or flesh to it, That's not the stone cut out with hands, and that can't break anything. It's the stone cut out without hands, so we represent that stone that's cut out without hands. And that's why people will bow and knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord, because they recognize... If you saw a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, what would you do? Oh, that happens every day. It gets better because that stone grows into a great mountain and fills the entire earth. Now, how would you feel if you saw that? Uh, Big deal. I knew it all the time. It's happened throughout the history of the earth. Huh? Just saw it last week. (laughs) It was on TV. And broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that, I like this, so that no trace of them was found. I like that. No trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So, to me, this is really cool. I mean, this is so big because the stone breaks Babylon in pieces and sweeps it away. But then the stone still has to grow into a great mountain. I mean, you would, this is what you would think, is that the stone would have to grow into a mountain, then crush the kingdom. No, it's just a stone that crushes the, king, the, the kingdom of Babylon. Then we get to grow into a mountain. That is so good. That's big. Yes. Yes. You better say We're it. trying to get to the stone. They didn't get it. Say it again. I can tell. I can feel it. <laughs> if you got it, you explain it. You're a better explainer. It's just the stone crushes, it, it strikes the feet. The, yeah, the rock is the church. The body of 
but so is the mountain. But the, the rock, yeah, and what is, listen, what does it refer to? What, when you see stone that's cut out without hands, what do we have in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about a rock? Peter. Peter. What did he say? He, he, yeah, he said, he, this is what he said. He, Simon says, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. And he says, he says blessed are you, Simon Barjona. He said, for flesh, listen, flesh and blood, in other words, Babylon did not reveal this to you. The letter did not reveal this to you. But my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And upon this stone, upon this rock, I will build my church. So when Daniel is seeing this rock, what's he seeing? He's seen the church. That's been, he's seen that rock that's cut out without hands. And that stone, look, strikes the feet of this image. Where do we get image in the New Testament? Think of what I've been teaching the last two weeks. <clears throat> He's the image of the Father, but we're talking about Babylon. What, what's, when we go to Revelation, what's it talk about? <clears throat> it says, He causes all upon the earth, what? To make an image of the beast. And the stone crushes, hits the feet of this image. Listen. And all of it is crushed. It's swept away by the wind. No trace is found. That's, the, that's what the stone does. Then it grows into a mountain and fills the whole earth. Then. Not until. Huh? Huh? Yeah, that's right. It's, yeah, you're just a stone when you get to do that. But then you turn into a mountain that fills the whole earth. And then you understand how the knowledge or the, how the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's because that's what we're supposed to do. And so when I look at where we're at and where we have to go, I'm thinking, this can only be you, God. <laughs> I mean, this... I mean. I mean, can this even be you, God? Can you even do this? <laughs> I mean, that, you're almost, you almost think that way. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field, and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand. That's basically what the, the devil has had. That's, he's ruled the earth, the beasts, everything. <clears throat> he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over all of them. You are this head of gold. You king of Babylon? Yeah. Yeah, see, and that's what I mean. Yeah, it's the king of Babylon. Now notice, again, we're talking blessing a head of pure gold, chest and arms of silver, bronze, iron, and then when we get down to the feet, it's iron and clay. <laughs> the God of heaven has given you strength, power, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. I think it's interesting too because if we go to Nebuchadnezzar, or I think it was a vision, maybe it was a vision that Daniel had, yeah, and he saw the four beasts. Remember? See, we're talking here four kingdoms. And remember what the last beast was? It was a beast that had teeth of iron. See, so we've got, we've got two different you know, uh, either visions or dreams. I don't remember if it was at Daniel's, but notice the fourth kingdom here was iron. And, and again, remember, Jesus, it says, Jesus shall rule them with a rod of what? Iron. So who is, so here we are, we're talking about Babylon, and here we go again. 
with he's taking God's stuff and using it and ruling over the earth with it. He says iron smashes everything into pieces. And that's exactly what's happening in the earth. Okay. He says, I want to read that again. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Now I want to... I see, I need to go to Luke. I'm going to read something about Luke. I want to read in Luke 11. I'd like to just... Oh, I hate to get... I wonder if I ought to save some of this. <laughs> What? What are you thinking? Luke 11, chapter 14. Jesus was driving a demon, out a demon. Oh, whoops, up. there I go again. Huh? Verse 14, Verse 14 Luke eleven fourteen. 14. And he was, ca- I'm going to go back to the New King James. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled, but some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. Now what did we just read in Daniel about the feet? So they, they, yeah, they said this kingdom is divided. See, I've heard preachers preach on this, and they say, and the, the other illustrations that Jesus gave in, I think Luke and or in Mark and Matthew, he says, can Satan cast out Satan? And so we automatically answer that question. We're answering a question that Jesus really isn't asking. Because what is Jesus doing there? He's saying, if my kingdom is divided, if I'm casting them out by Beelzebub, why are you worried about it? Why are you fighting so hard against it? Because my kingdom is divided, it's not, it won't stand. Because the, fair, the, the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day were so adamant against him. In fact, if we even go into the book of Acts, remember that guy Gamaliel? Or Gam, Gamaliel? What was his advice to, to the Sanhedrin? He, 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 said, he said, remember this one guy? He said he rose up and he, he had 400 that went with him. And as soon as he was slain, he said they got dispersed. And then he said, remember Judas of, of Judah or something like that? And he said he was, became something. And when he perished, he said that all came to nothing. He, says, he said, if it's of man, it's going to fail. If it's of God, you're going to find yourself fighting against God. So Jesus is using this same illustration here. He's saying, if I cast out demons by the tails above, every kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. He's not saying that Satan can't cast out Satan. Who owns sickness? Who owns, de- who owns the, the demonic realm? Then why couldn't he cast them out? Why, can't, why couldn't he ap- uh, at least appear to heal people? Because we read last week Remember in Thessalonians where it said that sign and that wonder is not a different sign and wonder. It's a different aspect of the same sign and wonder. He's not saying that Satan can't do that. He's saying that if my kingdom is divided, it's going to fall. And we just read in Daniel, his kingdom is divided. Look, you can't look out there in the earth and not see that Satan's kingdom is divided against itself constantly. It's, they're con- yeah, it's like the mob. They're constantly... I mean, I don't care, and it's getting worse. The division is... The, the, the dividing of his kingdom, the division of his kingdom, the clay and the iron is really showing up. Men against women, children against parents, transgender against normal, you know, gay against straight. Republican, Democrat, 
country to country, state to state, government to government, college to college. It doesn't make any difference what it is. They're constantly divided and fighting against one another. So Jesus is saying, if I'm doing this by Beelzebub, let me go. When, when you slay me, this will be the end of it. Because my followers will give up. And here we are 2,000 years later, and what's happened? It's just getting stronger, isn't it? And God is revealing more and more of what His people are supposed to be. So see, it was of God, wasn't it? That's how we know. I want to read that again. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be, listen to this, partly strong and partly fragile. Boy, if that's, you talk, there's the church. We're partly, I mean, for the most part, we're partly strong, right? I mean, we've got great, in some things, boy, we got great words. We, sometimes we have great prayers. Sometimes we have great preaching. Sometimes we have, uh, you know, great, uh, you know, uh, outpouring, so to speak. But we're also very fragile. Well, they said this about me. Well, they did this. Well, they looked at me this way. They did. I mean, you, you, it, it look, that's what it, it, I hate those feet. Because it can throw you for such a loop. Because one minute it's strong and powerful, and the next minute it's fragile. So that's why he says, come out of her, my people. See, Jesus said he'd rule the nations with a rod of what? And what does iron do? What did we just read that iron does? It crushes all other kingdoms, right? So any kingdom we've got in ourselves that's not of Him, if He's going to rule with a rod of iron, guess what's going to happen to that kingdom? Or get, let, what's supposed to happen to that kingdom? It's supposed to fall. Yeah. With no trace. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men. But they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, oh, I like this, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. See, I like that. It says, the great God has known made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream, listen, I like this. It doesn't say the dream is almost certain. It says the dream is certain. God's going to have a church that's going to break in pieces. These, this, yeah, this image. He's going to have it. If it's not us, it's going to be somebody else, but he's going to have it. <clears throat> And its interpretation is sure. So it's a certain and sure thing that this is what we're going to become. So when I read this, and, and again, you know, my calling is to see these things, and sometimes people can think, you know, well, you, you know I, I, speak, I see a lot of negativity or I see a lot of things wrong. And there's nothing wrong with seeing a lot of things wrong as long as you also see the things that are supposed to be right. You know what I mean? We're not supposed to just be telling people everything that's wrong. And that's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read this, that scripture at the end. 
there's just a lot of stuff going on. I've been, you know, listening to some ministries and and uh, probably even in our own in our own ministry itself. You know, a lot of people get on. You know, the internet can be a good thing, but the internet is mostly a bad thing. <laughs> you know that uh, because people can you can get on there and you can tell people things that they're doing wrong. You can criticize different ministries and stuff, but. There's no responsibility in what you're saying. Do you know what I mean by that? You see, I expose Babylon to you guys because I'm responsible for your lives. But when I ride an internet with somebody, see, I don't have a relationship with people on the internet. You may have a casual acquaintance, but you cannot have an, an, a, a, a relationship with somebody on the internet without knowing them face to face. I'm sorry, but you can't. I don't care what anybody... Oh yeah, I write them every day. That doesn't matter. You're not with them to see how they act and react, and that's what it takes to be... Rela- I mean, if, I just, if Kathy and I just texted back and forth all the time for a whole marriage, what kind of relationship would that be? And people are so quick to get on the internet and, and write you know, religious stuff all the time. And you've got to remember that when that thing goes out there, I don't know, what's Twitter? Is that? It's kind of like Facebook. It's it, it, Oh, it's a short form of Facebook? Is that what it is? Okay, I didn't know. I, I heard people talk about Twitter. I heard people talk about Facebook. See, I'm not on either one of them. But when you put that out there, does it go over the whole world? You're reading everybody else's Twitter, posts? You put one out and everybody else reads it, so you follow people. So but, can you, but can you do that with Facebook? Can you put your own stuff out there? Yeah. And it goes over the whole world? Yeah. That goes over the whole world, folks. <laughs> the whole world! So you always need to be careful. Even when I want to answer people on my forums, when they get into it, there's a big Christianity discussion now. Now, and how did Christianity get involved with, with 50 Muslims being killed in New Zealand? How did Christianity get in that form? Because somebody wants to criticize Christianity. And, I, and I, I'm, I always have to sit there and pray and say, do I want to get involved with this? Because I am not in relationship with those people. And what I put on out there, anybody in the world can see it. So I have to be very, very careful of what I put out there. And there's a whole lot of Babylonian stuff going out there. People, you know, writing their feelings. You know, well, I feel, you know, even when people preach, this always drives me nuts because to me, this is kind of Babylon, is when you try to interpret how somebody was feeling in the Bible. Oh, I'll bet Mary felt this way. I'll bet John felt this way. You don't know how they felt. You didn't live back then. We live in a, they're not Americans. I know people right now who feel like they want to get in their mother's purse to get something, gum or money or something. That would have never, we, Kathy and I would have never felt that way. That would have never crossed our minds. I mean, it's not that it would have crossed our minds and we felt that way, but we didn't do it because we knew it was wrong. That was a thought that would never come to us. This privacy stuff about, this is my room, it's, I'm, this is my privacy. They, that didn't, it never entered our mind that we had private, a private room. Yeah, it was, it was called my room because I slept there. Because I had toys or whatever, I had my stuff there. But there was no way, I, if my mom walked in on us, there, it, it would never cross our minds to say, I want some privacy here, what are you, you're supposed to knock. They just walked in. Oh yeah, you almost felt like you were going into a special place when, when, we walk, when, when you got to go into their room. You didn't dare go in there by yourself. And if you got to go in there with them, you, it almost felt like you were going to the, to the Taj Mahal or something. Yeah, that you were special. But how is it nowadays? So you can't look and read the Bible and say, oh, I bet they felt this way because you're putting your yeah. feelings on it that they may not have had. 
Oh, but Jesus felt this way. You don't have any idea how he felt in a particular situation. Yes, he was tempted in all points just as we are, but you can't sit there and pick out his life and say, oh, well, he probably he felt this way, and he felt this way. And people just eat that stuff up. You know, sometimes I have to ask, why is it do people like the ministers that they like? Is it because that minister is pressing them to become the stone that smashes the feet and crushes the, the image into pieces? Or is it because that minister is giving them license to feel a certain way? Do you know what I mean by that? No, no, wait a minute. I'm, I'm going to give you some blatant examples, but there's some real subtle ones too. Remember when we were at the conference and the guy said, I'll bet Paul was a guy who liked to watch R-rated movies and blow them up. That's blatant. Now remember what we read in Romans chapter 8 a couple of weeks ago. It said, the fleshly mind desires the flesh, the spirit mind desires the spirit. So when somebody says, yeah, I bet Paul liked R-rated movies, would the spirit desire that? Yeah, wanting to be a Rambo and kill, yeah, and kill him. Would, would the spirit desire that? Or would the flesh desire that? See, that's always the question when I'm listening to music, to preaching. Does the flesh desire this? Or does the spirit desire this? I heard that we had an ecumenical teaching here several years ago in, in uh, I can't remember in what church we were in, but he said something about it. He was using the apostles as an example. When they were in fear, you know, after Jesus was uh, taken prisoner, and they, they said, so it's okay for you to feel fear because the, the, the apostles felt fear, so it's okay for you. Question, is that, does the flesh desire that? Or does the, does the spirit desire, does the spirit desire you to have fear? No. no. See, those are real obvious. But every once in a while, you have to be careful. And even when, I, even when we talk about ourselves, like I've talked to you about people who don't dim their lights, you know, when they come over a hill, or people who won't pull up to the front pump. But I always give you the impression, I need to change in those areas, don't I? All right, but see, a lot of people will use illustrations like that and get you to laughing because, yeah, because you all feel the same way, but they'll never indicate to you that it's wrong. And so you feel better. Hey, it's a, if that big leader feels that way, it's okay for me to feel this way. And they get you to laughing at sin, and sometimes it is, it's funny. I mean, you know, because some of the stuff we get upset at is really stupid. And so you can laugh at it, but it should always be brought to the, to the forefront that we're trying to get rid of those attitudes, right? And that nature and character. And a lot of ministers don't do it. I hear a lot of them talk about, oh, they want to get even with this person. Oh, they want to cut this person off. And, tra and everybody's laughing and giggling. You know, you've heard stuff about... Uh, you know, oh, that speed limit sign, you know, that, that was, you know, I want to go faster. I'm going to go faster than that speed limit sign. Uh, excuse me, is that the flesh that desires that or the spirit that desires that? And what are you putting out? And so we, now that we have the internet, you're, that's going over the whole world. You're not just dealing now with a group of people, you're going over the whole world. We're supposed to be crushing in pieces. That kingdom. And yet, when I listen to ministers, I, I'm, sometimes I think, I wonder why, here's a real, this was really blatant. Remember the one I told you about where, they, where the guy said, huh? No, not that one. <laughs> that was, <clears throat> where he said, yeah, he said, you married couples, you need to watch pornography. That'll help your marriage. Now, is, yeah, yeah, come on. You don't even have to be... <laughs> You got to be a real goldenrod to not figure this one out. Does the spirit desire that, or does the flesh desire that? Yeah, and it's, so it says, and the, it says, fleshly minded is what the carly minded is what death. And so we preach this stuff, and every time somebody wants to tell a story about them, that's fine, but they need to at least give the indication, hey, this is a wrong attitude, and I'm, we need to, I need to try to get... But most of the time, they don't. They tell the big funny story about the attitude that they have towards somebody or something, and everybody's laughing and give. Listen, anytime somebody starts laughing, let a flag come up. 
And ask yourself, does the Spirit desire this? Or does the flesh desire this? And sometimes we can laugh, and it's okay. I'm not saying, you know, people, this is where, we get in, where I get in trouble, because people say, well, you're just so religious. You're a legalist. You know, anytime somebody says that, you, a flag should come up and say, why are you saying this? Are you trying to justify a fleshly attitude and make me feel guilty because I think it's wrong? It, it could be legalism. I'm not, I'm not taking that out of it. It could be religiosity. But there's a whole lot of coarse jesting that goes on. You know that? And you listen to it and you think, well, it's okay for me then to be this way. That's why I like this ministry. And I know a lot of people that are attracted to ministries because of that. Not because they're being pressed forward. Being pressed more into God. You know, we can have a great message and blow the whole thing. You can, you can preach for, an, for two hours and have the anointing on you, have God all over the people, all over you, and then in the last minute, destroy the whole thing with a carnal statement or, a car, or giving a carnal attitude. You know, you go into a conference and they start telling jokes. The only one I can remember is, never play leapfrog with a unicorn. <laughs> See, I know. It, 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 and really... Look, there's nothing wrong with the joke itself. It's they were telling it to begin their sermon with. And they had a whole bunch of stuff like that. And you're thinking, what does this have to do with God? And see, people do that all the time. And they'll, they'll, so you, could blow, you can blow an entire teaching, an entire anointed session with God by then telling a story about yourself or telling some joke or something that now makes everybody feel, it's okay if I feel carnal. It just wiped it out. That's what this mingling is. It's a mixture. It's a, in other words, you're preaching iron and then you throw some clay in there. And it can't stay. It can't stand. It comes down. You're still laughing. Sorry. <laughs> You're still laughing. <laughs> she's, tr she's trying not to. <clears throat> I just simply use that as an illustration. I know it, it, it's, it's a kind of a, it's, it's bathroom humor is what it was. And so were all the rest of them. And you'll find stuff, yeah, the one about, huh? Yeah, picking at women. You know, um, you, you know just you know, saying something... You know what I mean? Or even saying something about age. You know what I mean? You could say something about age and make people laugh, you know, and, and th you automatically make people think, well, it's okay then if this happens to me because I'm getting older. You see what I mean? If we make some statement about, well, you know, my eyes aren't as good or I can't do this anymore because of my age or this or that, and, and you make a funny thing out of it, and you automatically allowed people now to become what that is. You see what I'm saying? And we're supposed to destroy that. What? Yeah, you're, you, well, you loose it, yeah. And you, now we're not only loosening it on our congregations, we're loosening it over the whole world. We're on the Internet. So we have to be very careful about things we say and things we preach and things we do. And those of you that are on Facebook and Twitter or whatever all that stuff is, man, you need to be careful what you're putting out there. Even if it's kingdom of God stuff, you have to pray and find out, do I, you know, I have no relationship with these people. It, you know, if, if God tells you to put something out there, a teaching or a concept or something, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But we, it, most of the time when we want to get on there, we want to defend something. And you're already in trouble when you want to defend something. Because I can tell you right now, this may come as a real shock to you, God doesn't need defense. He doesn't need to be defended. And that's why I always have to check my heart 
before I answer some of these people, is do, do I really want to help them or do I just want to throw out a defense, you know, for, for God? And uh, there was another thread about, see, here we go again. They're talking about the Democrats and socialism. And Ananias and Sapphira got brought up in that thread because they had all things in common. And one guy wrote, this is what he wrote. He said, well, th- that's like the, New T- the Christians in the New Testament said they had socialism and they had all things in common. And, and look at the penalty they paid for not wanting to, to go in that system. Look, look at the penalty that Ananias and Sapphira paid for not wanting to go in that system. And I thought, what? Yeah, I thought, excuse me, that, that's not why that happened. It, yeah, read your Bible. It happened because Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit. Had nothing. They could have given. They could have said we sold the property for a million dollars, and they could have kept nine hundred thousand if they'd have just said we're going to keep nine hundred thousand and give a hundred thousand. But they lied, and they said we're going to give it all, and they kept part of it back. And I thought, boy, should I answer that? And I thought, yeah, I, these people that are saying this, they're not looking for an answer. They're not hungering for God. They're just wanting to make an argument. And I thought, I don't need to get involved in that. Somebody else wrote it and answered it. And the argument continued. They just blew by it and then just started something else. You know, so it, it, they're not looking for an answer. So God doesn't need to be defended. That's all Babylonian thinking. It's part iron and it's part clay. You're giving them, I would have been giving them the word of God, but I've been giving them my clay defense. You see what I mean? My, yeah, my clay motive. And we're supposed to destroy that kingdom. And I really like that. The dream is certain and sure. It's going to come to pass. And that's supposed to be us. Yeah, the bar is way higher than where we're at. <laughs> yeah, where we even thought it was going to be. We're supposed to be a mountain that fills the whole earth. What? You got something? I thought so. Yeah. I was thinking um, the bar is set higher in the fact that you're seeing this and speaking these things to us the last few weeks is because uh, we're coming to a place where the bar already was if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So he has to raise the bar higher. So it's actually, even though we can look and think, oh my gosh, it's so much further to go, it's actually a good thing because it proves we've come up higher. Mm -hmm. And so now he's look up a little higher. Reach for a little more of the goal of who I am. Mm -hmm. Become more like me because, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we were laid down here, you know. And so the bar was set up and we were attaining to that. Now it's going higher because we go higher. It's actually encouraging for all of us. Yeah. yeah. It, Otherwise, it, he would the, not have unveiled this. Right. The spiritual mind, it'll be encouraging. The carnal mind will be discouraged because they, they're, not, they're not able to see. But I know what you're saying. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just like in lifting weights. Yeah. If you make it to a certain weight limit, what do you want to do? You add more weight. You add more weight. It's the same thing. Yeah. And you look at the fact that when I started out, I could lift 50 pounds. Now I can wrench press 200, but now I've got to get to 225. You see, that's, what, that's the illustration you use. All right, I've got one last scripture, and that's in Romans chapter 13. And I'll just read the uh, last verse, 13, 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. I think it's interesting that none of the New Testament writers ever write to you joking about how a carnal feeling that they had. You know what I mean? They never they never tell funny stories about themselves. When Paul wrote any of his epistles or John or anybody, they never told funny stories about, well, I felt this person cut me off in traffic and I felt this way and And, you know, I wanted to do this or that, and everybody's laughing. They never did any of that. He said, make no, how many provision? 
None. None. What does no provision mean? Nothing. Zilch. Zero. So that's when I listen to people, or even when you sometimes when you listen to songs, you got to listen. Are they making a provision there for my flesh? And that's why I was asking myself, do they really like the minister because they're pressing them to a higher call in Christ Jesus? Because they're actually teaching them to put on more of Christ? Or because they're, they, every once in a while they throw out a provision of the flesh? Here's a provision of the flesh. Well, of course, we can't be perfect. There's a provision of the flesh right there. Here's a provision of the flesh. Well, you, you know, people should just worship in the way that's comfortable for them. You just made a provision for the flesh. How about this? We, we talked about floods. And while you guys were talking about the floods, you know, and people were told to get out of there. You know what some people, you know what some ministries are going to say? Well, you should just speak to that flood. You should take authority over that. You should confess it, and that way it won't touch you. You just made a provision for the flesh. Because there's been a lot of people that have done that and died. The fleshly mind is the carnal mind is what? Is is what? It's enmity, but what's the end result? Death. Death. Speak the word over that situation. Now, if God, te- listen, if God tells you to speak the word over that situation, I'm all for it. That would be a tremendous event. Wouldn't it? I mean, would that be an event? If, if it flooded, but your house stayed dry, but the waters were at two feet, three feet tall, like the Red Sea, but you were on dry land, would that be it? Tell me, would that be it? Yeah. That'd be a sign and a wonder, wouldn't it? That'd be wonderful. But you're never told that. You're just told to speak the word. It has nothing to do with whether God tells you to. You're just told to speak the word over that. That is Babylon. Yes. That is making provision for the flesh, and that's what the flesh desires. That's partly iron. You're speaking the word, but it's partly clay because it's flesh, and, it, and a stone is going to hit it, and it's going to come down. If God tells you to speak the word, by all means, I'm speak the word. If he gives you a scripture to speak, I want to emphasize that. By all means, you speak it. But we were never taught that. And it's still most it's still not being taught. It's being taught. You take the word under your own. You've got authority. You take the word, you speak it over that, and it'll change. Partly of iron, partly of clay. When God says to run, you run. (laughs) When God told me not to go over the mountains when it was snowing, I didn't go over the mountains when it was snowing. (laughs) I stayed in the motel an extra day. I didn't say, I speak to that snow and I commanded to leave the highway. You remember that guy that got on the plane? Yeah. He thought the devil was trying to keep him from his ministry. So he was speaking the word and confessing this, and he was taking his authority. He died in the airplane. And that's why so many people have a hard time understanding faith and why we have a, why we have a difficult time stepping out in what God says. Do you know why? It's because we've stepped out, and we've seen people step out so many times in the written word, and it failed. So we're never sure. But if God speaks, you can be sure. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The dream is certain. When God speaks, it'll come to pass. God doesn't lie. God doesn't test you. God doesn't tell you things He's going to do and then not do them just to see if you'll believe Him if it doesn't come to pass. God doesn't do that. That's unjust. And it would be lying anyway. And God doesn't lie. Okay. Any question? Oh, okay.
Hope I can answer. Well, I wasn't here last week, and I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, so maybe I missed stuff then. But um, So are you saying, like, all of this that you just read in Daniel, is this just supposed to be a representation of the religious system? Like, so different things come into power, and then they fall, and they come into power, and they fall. So it's a kingdom divided against itself. So is that, like, kind of what you're saying when you're reading all that? Yeah, the kingdom, see, all of those kingdoms, what's holding them up is the feet. That's partly of iron and partly of clay. And the kingdoms themselves are pure, but what's holding them up is, is divided. So what's your question? Well, I mean, I, I guess I need to know what your question is. I guess, like, I'm just trying to understand what all this means about you know, Nebuchadnezzar, this is your kingdom, but it's going to fall and another one's going to rise, and it's going to fall and another one's going to rise. Like, is that supposed to be interpretation of, like, the, yeah, the Babylon system or the religious system? Like, it, it's, so, like, we say, you know, you have, you, we had, like, um, denominational churches, and that reigned, and then it kind of fell, and you had word of faith, and it falls, and you has charismatic, or charismatic, or you have Pentecostal, like, there's all those different, kingdoms that rise but they're so divided the system's so divided against itself that they're rising and falling all the time mm -hmm. is that kind of what you can see this is you know when you look at the image or the dream that nebuchadnezzar had it it means more than just one thing it's got a natural meaning and it's got a spiritual meaning so it, when you look at the he's the head of gold then you've got silver then you've got bronze Remember, you've got, th you've got three kingdoms there, and then you've got iron, which smashes all the other ones. It's the same thing when, if it was either, I think it was a vision that Daniel had. He saw a leopard, a, a bear, and he, he gave three different leaders, and then he said the fourth beast is, was different from the other three. See, he said it had teeth of iron, and it crushed everything as well. And so you're talking, when you're looking at the gold, the silver, and the bronze, you, it's actually talking about natural kingdoms. But, it's, but the whole image of itself, the spiritual meaning, is actually Babylon, or the religious system. Okay, so then with the iron, like you said, he, Jesus rules with a rod of iron, mm -hmm. but then it says the stone crushes the iron, so... <clears throat> Is that even like, like I know you taught one time the head that was wounded but then came alive mm -hmm. again is like our wrong perception of who Jesus yeah, is. Right. Is, that, is that what you think that means? Because like when you get over here, the stone even crushes the iron. It, yeah, it, what, because the only reason it crushes the iron is because it's mixed with clay. Okay. It's got the mixture in it. See, that's, like it says, the, 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 the ceramic, the NIV says ceramic, I think it's New King James says potter's clay, doesn't it? Yeah, the clay, notice it says it cannot mix with the iron. And it says they're divided. So if you crush, in other words, you can take a stone, and if something is mixed like that, you can hit it, and it, it will, it'll, it'll break it apart. But if the feet were solid iron, the stone couldn't crush it. But because it's mixed with flesh, see, you've got to remember, the iron is, is God's stuff. Yeah, it is. Iron crushes all of the all of the. That's what it says. Iron, iron crushes everything. Iron can crush bronze. It can crush silver, and it can crush gold. And so it's mixed. It's partly of iron. The ceramic clay represents the fleshly desires. It represents uh, who we are, man's power, man's way, and it's mixing with God's. It's mixing with God's stuff. And if you, if you have something that's, that's standing, because notice it's an image that's standing. If you break it and the, and the, the pieces of clay break out, it's, it will lose its balance. It's going to topple. If you own something like that and you hit it like that, it would topple it. Try it sometime. Make some partially feet of clay and then hit it and watch what happens. That probably didn't answer you. Huh? I didn't think so. Well, well, what is it? What did you want to know? I don't. I just, I'm just trying to understand what it is. 
Oh, you are? <laughs> okay. Do you think you can? No? Okay. Anybody else? Well, you said you had two questions. Or was that them? See, all, all natural kingdoms are based on Babylon. Because if you recall, we, we learned, I don't know, several months ago, or I read that all, all those that have slain on the earth are found in her. So all kingdoms are based in this earth, except for the kingdom of God is based on a Babylon. All the religious systems, like you say, the denominations, all, they're all based on some form of a Babylonian system. It's, it's mixed. It's taking God's word and it's mixing it with flesh. Anybody else? Just be careful, man, on that Twitter, Facebook stuff. You know, Paul says, let your, let your speech be seasoned with what? Salt. Grace. Coarse jesting. You know, those guys were real... They'd be accused of being religious today. Huh? Yeah, they, they would. Because they were really strict on how you should how church should be done and what should be said and not said and everything. And so we need to be careful, okay? And let's crush this thing. See another thing too is <clears throat> a stone that's cut out without hands. You don't know how hard that stone is. We, all, we just think stone as in what we know. But in this system, iron crushes stone. Anything? Nothing? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And God, we just thank you that we're the stone. And we're going to crush all other things. We're going to break and bring that thing down and crush it, and it'll come toppling down, and we just thank you that we get to be called and chosen. Let us choose to do this, and God, give us recognition when somebody or anybody is making provision for the flesh. In anything we sing, anything that's being spoken, we just have to ask the question, does the Spirit desire this? Or does the flesh desire this? And that will answer it. Because Father, we thank you that you strengthen us, that you, as we go forth this week, that you're on our minds all the time. And we love you. And thank you. Amen.